<laughs> Welcome to tonight's virtual meeting of the Port Phillip City Council. I hope you are all well at home and coping in this difficult time. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the traditional owners on the lands from which we meet today. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present, and we acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. So due to the current COVID-19 restrictions, we are obviously streaming through the WebEx platform and our webcast page and Facebook Live. Whilst we've made every uh, arrangement that we can uh, for this online meeting, there's always the risk of technical issues that are beyond our control. And if we do uh, in encounter these, we will uh, try to fix them and maybe adjourn. If there, for some reason we cannot resolve these issues, we will adjourn to a later date and inform the public of the time and place as soon as possible. All the submissions from members of the public will be heard at the start of the meeting and additionally voting on all motions will be under division where the chair will call upon councillors individually in rotating alphabetical order to state their vote. I do remind attendees that any member of the public addressing council must extend due courtesy and respect to council and the processes under which it operates and must take direction from the chair whenever called on to do so. Speakers must remain respectful and statements or questions must not be defamatory, offensive or objectionable, aimed at embarrassing a councillor or a member of council staff or relate to a matter outside the powers of council. But before moving on to uh, the first item on the agenda, I have been advised by the CEO that he wishes to remove an item from tonight's meeting and I ask him to please advise the meeting. Thank you and through you, Mayor, and with your consent, Mayor, I am uh, requesting removal of item 14, being the notice and motion by Council, Councillor Pearl, in relation to Anzac Station and Albert Road. I'm doing this under Government Rule 19 and with the consent of Councillor Pearl. I do apologise for the late notice. It's come to our attention that there are some operational implications with the way the motion was constructed. Um, and the adequacy of the assistance we gave to Council Pearl in constructing that motion. And uh, I ask that this item be withdrawn in order to assist the councillor to refine the motion before republishing it on an upcoming agenda. Uh, I approve of that. Thank you. If I could just also thank the CEO, Council Pearl here, just thank the CEO and his staff for um, the guidance they provided me on that today. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, councillors, we will start with apologies. Do we have any? We, we've all made it online, despite there being internet issues in Elwood today. Uh, two minutes of the previous meetings, councillors, the minutes of the ordinary meeting held on the 7th of July, 2021 have been circulated. Are there any questions regarding these minutes? If not, could I have a motion to confirm these minutes? Moved by Councillor Pearl, seconded by I will second them. So I will now put the motion under division and call upon each councillor for your vote. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Ma Thank you. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Well, that motion is carried. Uh, three is the declarations of conflicts of interest. Does anyone have a conflict of interest in a matter being discussed at tonight's meeting? I have an interest, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Martin, go ahead. In the item concerning sports grounds, can I note that I'm on the committee of one of our local sports clubs, the Port Melbourne Colts Junior Football Club. But given that the item refers to every single sporting oval in the city, I don't believe that I have a conflict. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So before we begin tonight, I'd like to bring a condolence motion to the chambers. Dr. Anne Longmire. So Dr. Anne Longmire is a respected educator, historian and author and passed away last week at the age of 70. Anne was commissioned by the city of St Kilda to write the third volume of the municipality's story, St Kilda, the show goes on, which is the history of St Kilda volume three from 1930 to 1983. This book continued from where J.B. Cooper's volumes one and two finished in 1930. So published in 1989, the show goes on was and continues to be a valuable record of the city 
and a testament to the quality of Anne's research and writing. The City of Port Phillip is grateful for Anne's contribution to our community through her careful, insightful, well-researched social history that weaves through the highs and lows of St Kilda from the Great Depression, through World War II, through St Kilda's difficult years in the 1960s and 70s, to the re-establishment of the area as a vibrant, creative place to live. Anne had written other books on local and social history and was a winner in the 2011 Victorian Community History Awards for the Catalysts, Change and Continuity, 1910 to 2010. This was another informative and insightful book about the history of the Catalyst Club, documenting an organisation of women with high ideals and ambitions for achieving a recognised role in society. The City of Port Phillip extends our condolences to her partner, Ray Watson, children, Alison, Deirdre and William and their families. Just to let you know, St Kilda, the show goes on, is available from the Port Phillip Heritage Centre and online as a digital book on the St Kilda Historical Society's website. And I recommend this book to all who have lived, worked or played in St Kilda and those who are interested in quality historical research and writing to understand our community, our streetscapes, our stories and our culture. Councillors, uh, I seek someone to move the motion. Uh, Councillor Pearl to move in, Councillor Copsey to second. Would you read out the motion, Councillor Pearl, as it's on the screen? Uh, that'd be my pleasure, Madam Mayor. So the motion is that Council expresses its deep regret on the passing of Dr Anne, Anne Longmire and secondly offers its sincere condolences to her family and places on the record its appreciation for her service for the City of Port Phillip. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to make a check if I may. Um, oh, did I move the motion? I don't know, actually. It's a good question. Do I uh, through comment? you, Mayor, I can clarify that my records show the motion was moved by Councillor Pearl and seconded by Councillor Copsey. And while I've got you, Miss Pierce, can I just check the spelling of Anne's name? Is it Anne with an E or without an E? Could I double check that? Uh, through you, Meb, I'll take that on notice to ensure that the minutes accurately reflect this. We have got it spelt two different ways in emails, I'm afraid. So I'll take that on notice and ensure the uh, public record is accurate. That would be great. Uh, so Councillor Pearl. Thank Would you, you like Madam Mayor. Um, just doing a quick Google search on my name for sure. I can see here uh, with an E by the looks of it. But actually, I'll just double check that. Um, look, I, I, I've, I've never met uh, this wonderful person, but I can tell you the legacy that these people leave. I have I have uh, flicked through the book. I wouldn't say I read it, but it sits in the offices, uh, in the councillor's office um, in a cupboard or on a bookshelf. And there's those three volumes that Councillor Crawford talked about and also a, an updated one for Port Phillip. There's a number of these books for municipalities in Victoria. Um, and these tell a story of critical moments and uh, critical decisions that were made that have drastic impacts in today, such as why the palm trees along, uh, one of the chapters I read was talking about the, the way the palm trees were farmed, um, formed along uh, the foreshore of St Kilda. Uh, the, the, the key actions that St Kilda uh, City Council took, particularly in terms of public housing and amenity during the 1970s and 1980s. But this is thankless work and whatever the person is paid to do this sort of work, uh, if anything in some circumstances, is absolutely priceless because this is the history that will endure and it's the history um, that will be remembered hopefully 100 years from now when people are researching uh, why St Kilda is the way it is uh, in the present time. So uh, I don't think we can underestimate the contribution that people such as Anne has made uh, and they, they rarely get the recognition that's required. So I hope the family do take uh, what we've said here this evening with some um, solace that uh, the contribution that Anne made to this city is very much respected, it is very much valued and we sincerely appreciate uh, everything she did and we our, our thoughts and prayers are with you and your family. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak? Thank you. Beautifully spoken, Councillor Pearl. 
And I will just add that um, Anne's work in documenting the happenings in St Kilda um, has been incredible. Uh, and her focus also on the contribution of women um, and creatives and, and intrepid, um, you know, contributors to public life uh, is, is noted and appreciated and I think um, continues to be a really important topic to explore. I just think it is um, a fitting legacy for the work that she has produced that in documenting the city's history in such a comprehensive and readable way um, and now with the passage of this motion I hope it contributes to uh, her part of that history um, and her contribution overall uh, as an important figure locally that now will be documented. Um, my sincere condolences to the family and my gratitude to Anne for her contribution. Would any other councillor like to speak to the motion? Uh, councillor Pearl, I'm assuming you don't want to close. No. All right, let's put that to the vote. Uh, councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In final. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. The motion is carried. Thank you, councillors. Uh, we'll now move to item four on the agenda, which is public question time and submissions. So we will hear all the public questions and comments on report items from members of the public and all requests to speak were required to be submitted by 4 p.m. this afternoon. Let me just grab my list. Uh, the first person who would like to speak um, in, in, uh, to, oh, well, in, on the condolence motion is uh, previous or former councillor David Brand. Are you with us, David? Uh, yes, I am. Great. Welcome. Uh, and I please uh, state your name and, and suburb and then I'm going to okay. be kind with oh, the three minutes. <laughs> I think I've got I think I'm going to be three minutes. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Brand uh, of St Kilda and I'm reading a letter uh, on behalf of this at the St Kilda Historical Society. Uh, and I certainly endorse we certainly endorse all of the words that the councillors have spoken. It's, it was beautifully said. Um, in 1983, uh, Anne Longmire made a marvellous and enduring uh, contribution to the city of St Kilda and thus to our city of Port Phillip. With the third volume of the history of St Kilda, she wrote at Council's Commission. It is a brilliant local history. It was designed to fill the widening gap in coverage since the publication of Cooper's Mammoth foundational two volume history of St Kilda in 1930. In scope, Anne's history is richer than Cooper's opening up far deeper social histories and broader cultural histories of the city and its people. It tells the stories of women and marginalised groups and non-mainstream cultures with, the, with equal agency and importance as the principles of economic development and male dominated councils, which is pretty much what Cooper's goes into. It paints a portrait of St Kilda that we still reference and imagine today. We often take for granted foundation histories like this without realising how important they are to our understandings of ourselves as a locality, as a community and a society. Supported by our historic photograph and art collections, which sort of illustrate them, our foundation histories are our origin narratives, our creation myths and legends that tell us who we are and where we came from. They illuminate what we love of our city, what we expect of our city, and what we can dream it could become. Anne's volume stands as one of the finest examples of a local history that goes to the heart. Like a naturalist's field guide, field guide it prompts us to see the environment around us as a, at a deeper historical and ecological level how all its complex elements got to be here and how they go together. It opens up and makes sense of the place we live in. The St Kilda Historical Society thanks Ang Longmire for this gift she has given us. We wish to join council in expressing our appreciation of her invaluable contribution to the story of our city and its peoples. 
Thank you very much, David. I now call upon Helen Halliday also speaking to the condolence motion. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak, uh, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, it, it is uh, quite amazing to me that um, almost invariably since the 1980s, uh, St Kilda has been represented by um, about 50% women and uh, the city of Port Phillip continues that tradition. Uh, the work that, that uh, Anne Longmire did, I now realise she was about the same age as me when she was talking to me about what um, my reflections on um, the city was at the time. Um, it was a city of great conflict, actually, because uh, there was, uh, well, first of all, me and within three years, three other women who uh, entered the, the um, be, becoming um, uh, councillors on the city and we actually had a fourth who failed quite uh, rapidly. Anyway, uh, putting that to one side, uh, she actually tackled all those issues, the issues of representation. She explained in that book why it was important for women to be there. She addressed issues such as childcare. She wasn't frightened to address issues such as social housing. Uh, we all recognised at the time, and um, it's come to me more recently, that there, there was quite a lot of poverty in the city at the time. Uh, it's amazing to, to see some of the images of um, young people in that era. Uh, so I, uh, I think um, the history she recorded was from the, 30, the economic decline of the 30s and uh, then the post-war period. Uh, we're optimistic now, but I think we still need to look pretty carefully at what our city is and try where we can to uh, equalise the values and the social conditions of the people that live here. I think Anne provided us with a snapshot of that uh, actually 50-year period and I value her contribution. I um, feel that her contribution supported and enabled women and other groups in the city who don't have um, the same access to power to have a voice and uh, I believe the city was a beneficiary of her work. Thank you Anne and thank you to the councillors. And Helen, thank you very much for your words. Could you just state for the record what suburb you're from? Uh, Balaclava. Thank you very much and thank you for your words. Uh, I'm now calling upon Steve Howe, who is speaking to item 7.1, which is the petition for basketball court lighting at Peanut Farm Reserve. Steve, are you with us? Uh, through you, Mayor. Steve is not here at the moment. Um, I will let you know if he arrives. Great. Well, uh, moving on to another petition item. It's I call upon John Hatsis speaking to 7.2, which is the petition, an objection to the approved permit and planned removal of a significant tree at Three Child Street, St Kilda. John. Yes, hi. Um, John, if you could state your name and suburb and then please, you've got three minutes to speak to the petition. Yep, um, John Hatsis, 12 Campbell Street, Brighton, um, rental provider at One Child Street. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to um, support the applicant, which is at Three, Charles Street, St Kilda, and bring to the council's attention a, a representation of the significant concerns the renters of both one Charles Street and three Charles Street, St Kilda, have with the overgrown bulging roots from the tree in the backyard of three Charles Street. The renters of one Charles Street, St Kilda, um, won't use the laundry in the backyard because they're scared and worried about the unstable surface to walk on and the possibility of the fence falling and there's massive bundles of leaves that they've got to you know walk through and overcome. The fence between one and three Charles Street um, is also because it's falling is encroaching on the open space of the backyard of the renters uh, and any um, discussion I've had about providing a new fence for them as a rental provider is going to have the same fate. 
Um, they're mindful of tripping um, over concrete. Um, I do strongly uphold the safety of the renters at one and number three, Charles Street, is paramount. Um, it is unfortunate that the tree is causing damage and directly affecting the safety of the renters. Um, I've also had discussions with the renters at three Charles Street, St Kilda, personally, and they have really sort of gone through and said as three teachers working uh, from home last year. There's nowhere to place the table outside for any quiet enjoyment and they feel deprived of their quite free open space. They're unable to use their laundry as well, which is also located in the outshed. And the leaves piled up around the tree are nearly up to the top of the fence height. They're at about four feet. Uh, Nadine, who is the owner at Five Charles Street, St Kilda, has also voice concerns to the managing agent who's representing three Charles Streets in Kilda that the fence between number three and number five Charles Street uh, is also falling. Uh, look, we'd be open to help and get access to, uh, for the person needed to look to to get to this tree. Um, I'd also, we'll also be happy to support any suitable replacement of a another tree species that would grow to a mature height of uh, three metres or so, that which would suit more the urban landscape environment than uh, the, the overgrown tree that's pressing on to properties. Um, I, I really feel that tr as a rental provider to try and rectify this precarious predicament uh, that the renters are in at both number one and three Charles Street, I do support the applicant at number three Charles Street in reinstating the permit to remove this tree and I'd look um, favourably on the granting of this permit in consideration to, of the council's arborist to, uh, to look at a suitable tree to replace this. Thank, Thank you very you. much, John. Appreciate it. Uh, I call upon James Norman speaking to the same petition, the objection to the approved permit and plan removal. James, are you there? Yeah. Thank you. James, if you could state your name and just suburb is enough and, and then you've got three minutes to speak. Sure. It's James Norman. I'm from St Kilda. Uh, good evening, councillors and everyone. Thank you for allowing us the time to speak about this matter. I'm speaking on behalf of the residents of 92 Barclay Street, which is the adjoining property to 3 Charles Street, where the majority of the tree actually overhangs. Um, as you can see from all the photos and the supporting letter that we've sent the councillor from an independent qualified arborist, what we're talking about here is a beautiful council, council recognised significant tree, home to a plethora of animals, including rainbow lorikeets and possums, right in the middle of the dense urban area of St Kilda. As the letter from the arborist Chris uh, Polifka notes, the tree still has an estimated life expectancy of 80 years. It's in a good state of health with evident new growth and the structure has no apparent decay or structural faults. As the arborist further notes, which I think is significant, with the proper planning and the right pruning, the tree can easily coexist with new property development. Furthermore, supporting evidence and photos that have been provided to councillors today show that the fences have in fact not been damaged by the tree. It's not actually touching the fences at all uh, and the uneven pavement, paving uh, has not been changed or maintained for the past year. So I think it's a bit rich to blame the tree for this evident neglect uh, on the part of the property managers of those particular properties. We also note that the same real estate agents did today engage tradesmen to begin clearing the area and cutting the tree roots, despite the permit having been cancelled. Um, on a broader note, I think at a time when our cities desperately need wildlife corridors and places where local animals can find habitat, at a time when we know this very council has recently declared a, declared a climate emergency, this is not the time to be needlessly destroying significant trees, simply because, in my view, Real estate agents and property investors don't want to take the trouble to property main, properly maintain their backyards and outdoor living areas. As we have now made clear from the outset, we're more than happy to discuss how the tree can be pruned back if there are out, you know, outstanding safety issues that need to be addressed. And we are ready and willing to enter into good faith uh, discussions along those lines. But what we can't support is the needless destruction of a beautiful living tree in our backyard that adds so much aesthetic, wildlife and cultural value to our home, as well as providing homes for so many local animals. 
We ask that the local council support the wishes of the people living uh, in the vicinity of this tree and reject this tree locking permit outright. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. I now call on uh, Travis Atkins speaking to item 12.1, which is the draft business parklet policy guidelines and fee structure. Travis. Uh, thank you, Travis Atkins, St Kilda, uh, representing St Kilda Seabar, St Kilda Tourism and Events. Uh, Madam Mayor, councillors, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, the parklets have been a glimmer of hope. They've been uh, atmospheric improvement to St Kilda, which has uh, been in the doldrums well before the pandemic. Um, it's created life, it's created enthusiasm, it's created uh, atmosphere. Uh, it's been very well managed in terms of we haven't seen any real issues um, and the public space is being used uh, very, very broadly and uh, we'd like to uh, uh, say it's been hugely supportive by both the residents and the businesses. And we do seek its extension to at least March 2021. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to, Travis, just stay with me for a second. Um, given that Travis is also speaking to another item, Kirsty, should I just get Travis to speak to that as well? Uh, through you, Mayor, absolutely. Travis, are you good to uh, speak to the second item, which is the Skyline Ferris wheel application? Yep, I certainly am. That'd be lovely. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, uh, your three minutes starts again. Wonderful. Um, I'm not going to talk about how hard business is or the loss of visitors to the city and how much support Melbourne City has had, which is also detracting from St Kilda's, because you're also no doubt aware. But I would like to make some simple points on the Ferris wheel. The big one for me is that in November and December 2020, we had a huge population surge with massive intoxication and drug taking on the foreshore. Public space became a zoo. And having some space managed through healthy family-based attractions that are professionally run is a much better outcome than what we saw then. I urge you to Google a current affair St Kilda if you aren't familiar with it. This media went global and further tarnished St Kilda's image and reputation. The Ferris wheel is a beacon of hope for the precinct. It is warmly embraced by other councils for the same six-month period. The space takes up a mere 5% of South Beach Reserve and there is more people able to participate in the attraction than the space it takes up uh, by a lot. The attraction is managed with government requirements within the COVID regulations, uh, South Beach Reserve is not. The wheel promotes safe activities for families and will be in place during the major construction works of St Kilda Pier. Economic recovery is imperative and this and other positive events and activities should be embraced at every turn by the whole community and councillors. Please support this wonderful initiative and others like it to assist to make St Kilda vibrant again. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. I now call upon Mary Stewart, uh, firstly to speak about item 12.1, which is the draft business parklet policy guidelines and fee structure. Hi, Mary. Thank you, Madam Chair and Councillors. Uh, my name is Mary Stewart. I live and I work in St Kilda and I speak on behalf of uh, Luna Park and also St Kilda Tourism and Events. I also um, uh, would like to commend uh, to the Council that they adopt the recommendation for the extension of the parklets and um, I would echo uh, what um, Travis Atkins has said in that uh, the initiative of council in terms of facilitating the parklets initially during uh, what was an enormously crucial period of, of seeking to establish uh, a level of economic sort of activity following very harsh COVID lockdowns uh, in Melbourne was enormously important. I think the, the parklets and the activity and the vibe that they have added to our streets has been enormously important, not just in terms of the capacity that it has given uh, the hospitality industry to work in the context of COVID restrictions, but also because it has added life and activity to our streets and, um, and provides a uh, very significant amenity. I would add that in terms of the continuing review 
that will occur. Uh, I know that there is a proposal in terms of um, the council generating some fees from the parklets. I would urge the council to waive any fees until we have seen a full economic recovery uh, in our city from the enormously severe impacts that COVID has had on uh, our economic viabilities. Thank you, Mary. Are you are you good then to also speak to? Oh, are you speaking to the Skyline Ferris wheel, which is item twelve point two? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I am. So, for the record, my name is Mary Stewart. I live in St Kilda. I work in St Kilda. I speak on behalf of Luna Park and also St Kilda Tourism and Events. And in terms of this item, I also would include um, another um, uh, portfolio that I have. I am the um, president-elect of the National Industry Association that represents uh, attractions and amusements and um, the operators of the Ferris wheel that is before you are a respected and, um, uh, and, and very active member of that industry association. Uh, we think that uh, approval for uh, the Ferris wheel on uh, South Beach Reserve is something that is very important for the way in which the public has the capacity to view that area of our city. As um, has been pointed out, we have had for a number of years suffered from some most unpleasant antisocial activities. What we want to do is to encourage uh, visitations that are family friendly and that uh, provide an alternative view of what you can do in St Kilda as opposed to turning up and um, behaving in, in manners that are not very acceptable. We think that the Ferris wheel uh, will add to um, uh, those things that are available for people to do in our city. The Ferris wheel itself will operate under very strict COVID um, uh, operating procedures that have been approved by um, uh, Victorian authorities, but are also consistent with the national uh, COVID safe operating procedures. And uh, in terms of uh, the Ferris wheel itself, visually it will be very impressive. It has a very small footprint and um, it has the capacity to be a welcoming sign for people coming to St Kilda. So I would um, recommend that the council adopt uh, the recommendation that is before it. Thank you, Mary. I now call upon Terry and Jane Jones uh, speaking to item 12.2, Skyline Ferris wheel application. Hello. Hello, thank you, Madam Mayor. If you could state your name and suburb and then please continue. Uh, my name is Jay Jones from Sandringham and I'm the Director of Extraordinary Events and we operate the Skyline Ferris Wheels throughout Australia. Skyline Ferris Wheel is Australia's tallest transportable Ferris Wheel and we think will be a fantastic addition to the St Kilda foreshore over the summer period. The Ferris Wheel attracts much needed, as we spoke about, family audiences to St Kilda and will help bring a family fun vibe to the St Kilda for sure. Um, we've gained support from local stakeholders, including Luna Park, the Stoke House, the Sea Baths and its tenants, and the tourism and events. And we've spoke with um, events that work on South Peaks River Reserve over the summer period and plan to work closely with all businesses and events in St Kilda with cross promotions and discount ticketing and hope to leverage uh, the media partner that we have, which will provide over $200,000 in airtime and social media posts. And we'll hope to leverage that for all the events and businesses in St Kilda to really highlight all the positive things that people are working so hard to do in St Kilda. We believe the first will, will bring significant economic benefit to the area and help aid the traders to navigate through financial benefit through the COVID return. 
Um, our Ferris wheel operates in high profile locations throughout Australia. And in those locations, we work closely with the councils and the traders and the residents to give the best economic benefit we can give for the region. And if I can just quote some of the benefits that other councillors, such as Terry Landsberg from Sunshine Council and the Darwin Waterfront um, Corporation and Holdfast Bay in Glenelg, they've all, um, the Sunshine Coast stated that in a two month location, it, it brought an extra million dollars to traders in 2020. The Darwin Waterfront Corporation stated that it increased the foot flow on the Stokes Hill Wharf by a minimum of 15%. And the um, Holdfast Bay Council suggested that approximately 2.6 million was injected into the community through the addition of the Ferris wheel over the summer last year. The Skyline Ferris wheel will only utilize approximately 5% of the space on South Beach Reserve. However, to ensure we can maximize usable public space over the summer period during the COVID recovery, we will dedicate the back deck area of the Ferris wheel as free public seating with branded giant St Kilda deck chairs. This will enable people of all ages to enjoy comfortable seating on South Beach Reserve. And the branded seats will also create great photo opportunities, which again will give that positive look for the St Kilda with the family vibe. Um, also, you know, the look of the wheel is, is very welcoming and creates a lot of social media images and imprints. And they're all positive imprints of families enjoying their time and having their wow moment down in St Kilda that people like to share. I will have to ask you to, to finish up then, if you could, please, Jane. Um, if we can bring it I to will. a close. We are excited to to try and work with the events team and city of Port Phillip to activate South Beach Reserve and do the best we can to help the traders and community through the COVID recovery. Thank you very much. I call upon David Blakely speaking to item 12.2 Skyline Ferris wheel application. David. David Blakely, St Kilda. I'm today I'm talking for Fitzroy Street Business Association as president. Um, a year, Mayor, councillors, thank you for your time. A year ago, I watched the first wheel go up, um, it has it, as it had a couple of other years before. I'm fortunate to watch it come down before a paying customer has gone around. Um, unfortunately, it was something, a prelude to what was to come over the last year with five lockdowns. St Kilda, as we know, has suffered awfully during the COVID crisis. Um, we had one of the highest rates of people on JobKeeper. We've seen businesses crash. We've had a population heavily invested in the arts, retail, hospitality have all suffered. And there is seen a 78% decrease in visitation from tourists. I, I believe the Ferris wheel um, will offer St Kilda a family option, um, adding to Luna Park and other locations around, around the area. It would help um, join Fitzroy Street and Ackland Street together with the SB and the and Luna Park and the Palais. And it's a beacon of hope. I mean, to see that light, it's always, I don't know, it brings, well, personally, it puts, it puts a smile on my face. Um, I think the, the loss of public space in erecting this Ferris wheel, I think is heavily offset by the benefit it brings to the areas. From people to buy an ice cream on the beach after, to people have a coffee on Atkins Street and a cake, to people who need to go to the pub after spending the day with the kids. Um, I, I, I hope um, reason pervades here and compassion for the local businesses and people who really had it tough last year, and we support the Ferris wheel. May if you mind, I don't mind, I, in my COVID brain and school homeschooling, I forgot about the parklets. So I just like to say a quick word on that. Yes. Um, the Parklet program has been amazing and I really su we support its continuation probably beyond September given the, the crisis in the lack of vaccine rates. Um, I think COVID is going to be with us through summer, unfortunately. Um, I also like to help 
wonder if we can continue the no fee option, given me and the parklets on um, are taking the place of car spots. There was no council fees received before. Um, it's been a great program. I know it's been problematic in some streets where park is at a premium, but certainly in St Kilda, I think it has merits to continue on. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, David. I call upon Angela Dawson speaking to item 12.2, the Skyline Ferris wheel application. Hi, Angela. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for your time this evening. My name is Angela Dawson. I am a local trader in St Kilda and a local resident of Canal Ward. I also sit on the board of the Port Phillip Licensees Association that represents licensed venues within the City of Port Phillip and the St Kilda Tourism and Events Association. Uh, as a re resident and trader within the City of Port Phillip, I fully support any activity in the city that drives visitation by families and visitors of all types. The Ferris Wheel is a feel-good activity that is supported by traders all across St Kilda. It takes up a minor amount of footprint, 5% of the total South Beach Reserve. And unlike other activations the City of Port Phillip promotes, such as April Sun, it does not take away from businesses um, it does, sorry, it does not take away business from local traders, but instead drives visitation and promotes our city's visitors to spend their tourist dollar with existing traders. More activations such as this, which benefits all traders and creates activity and vibrancy, should be supported wholeheartedly by the City of Port Phillip and the survival of local operators should be the number one priority. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm also speaking in relation to the parklets. Should I do that as well? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. For the record, my name is Angela Dawson. I am a local trader of St Kilda and a local resident of the Canal Ward. The parklets and beach activations have been the only notable economic recovery strategy that the City of Port Phillip has successfully actioned that directly assisted traders in navigating their way through the last 18 months. There is a strong consensus among the City of Port Phillip traders that we are the forgotten city. Whilst we watch the CBD receive more and more funding from the state and local governments, including the well-publicised CBD dining dollars and restaurant vouchers, the City of Port Phillip is asking traders to pay for their parklets. We all understand that the car park spaces are a source of income to the council, but the question begs to be asked, how many car park spaces would the City of Port Phillip expect to fill without visitation? Is there not enough car park spaces that some of these could be given to small business to aid in the economic recovery? Parklets have allowed traders to remain COVID safe by having more outdoor diner, diners, Meanwhile, adding atmosphere to our city, which has become decimated due to the lack of visitation. If the City of Port Phillip takes these parklets away from traders or makes them financially untenable, it would be the nail in the coffin for the entire precinct, whose traders are, after five lockdowns, hanging on by a thread. Councillors, I ask you to support the parklets as they have been a huge success for small and medium business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. Uh, Steve Howe is not with us, but I will get Kirsty Pierce to read out his statement. And Steve's speaking in regards to the basketball court lighting petition at, for Peanut Farm Reserve. Uh, through you, Matt, and Steve has tried to um, get home in time, but hasn't made it, unfortunately. He has submitted that he would basically just like to say that he thinks the lights would be a great benefit to the community and there is basically no downside to putting them on. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, I believe now we're moving to um, uh, some submissions that will be read out on behalf of members of the public. And I will call on you, uh, Kirsty, as Head of Governance to read a summary of the submissions. Uh, so we might uh, start with um, Janet Rosenberg, if that's okay. Item 12.2, the Skyline Ferris wheel application. Would you follow on from what we've just heard? Certainly through you, Mayor. Uh, Janet writes as the president of the Ackland Street Traders, we fully support the Ferris wheel coming to South Beach Reserve. The continual loss of events and patronage due to lockdowns has seen a massive decline in tourists, over 78%. 
This has had a massive negative effect on traders and businesses. Anything that could arrest this decline will bring economic benefit to our community. The Ferris wheel, large and visually colourful, will provide St Kilda with a great family attraction at a time where we desperately need help. Hopefully families that come to enjoy the Ferris wheel will also wander up our streets and patronise restaurants and retail premises. The longer it stays, the better. It takes up a small part of South Beach Reserve and will allow for other activities in the beach area. The attraction, I believe, is supported by all other traders across St Kilda. We urge you to approve the Ferris wheel as part of the process to aid St Kilda's economic recovery. Thank you. Uh, we now have three questions from Adrian Jackson. Through you, Mayor, the first question reads, following on from officer comment at the meeting on 7 July on why soap and paper towels were withdrawn from council toilets due to theft and vandalism, does the council support this position that soap and hand towels are not present in council outdoor toilets? I believe Lachlan Johnson is going to respond. Through you, Mayor, I'd like to thank Adrian Jackson for his question. Uh, as Mr Jackson indicated, at the last council meeting, I provided advice that council no longer provides soap and hand towels in public toilets. This change was made a number of years ago in response to vandalism and theft. This remains the current approach taken to provide facilities for the public. Uh, as I indicated at the last council meeting, any councillor may table a notice of motion to have officers provide further information on this or and or prepare proposals for the reintroduction of soap and hand towels in public toilets. Thank you. Uh, another question then, please, Kirsty, from Adrian through Jackson. You, through you, Mayor, and this question reads, will Council allow events such as the steel timber sports events and hot rod shows to be staged when it is again safe to do so given the COVID threat currently, rather than continue with the St Kilda Music Festival, which costs the municipality greatly? Kylie Bennett's. Through you, Mayor, Council will continue to work with event producers to stage events in a COVID safe ma manner as guided by the Department of Health. In conjunction, we will deliver our own programs of arts, festivals and events to assist the community, our traders and cultural organisations with economic, cultural and social recovery. Thank you. And finally, through you, Mayor, this question reads, a few years ago, Ackland Street at corner Barclay Street, St Kilda, was closed to create a plaza. Even before COVID affected the area, this plaza was not performing a useful function after the intersection was closed to car traffic. Does Council think that this plaza has been an unsuccessful project? Ah, uh, sorry, who have I got to that? I just moved my papers, um, sorry. Through you, Mayor, I can... Thank you, Kylie. I <laughs> just turned over the wrong sheet of paper. Uh, through you, Mayor, works to revitalise the Ackland Street streetscape and upgrade the tram terminus were delivered through a partnership between the state and local government, in particular Public Transport Victoria, the City of Port Phillip and Yarra Trams. A 12-month post-construction evaluation was conducted in February 2019, which looked at community satisfaction, pedestrian counts, transport conditions, uh, amongst other things. Details of this evaluation can be found on Council's website. Since then, the entire municipality, including Ackland Street, have been impacted by COVID-19. Council has been working closely with traders over the last 12 months to help reinvigorate the city under the COVID-19 economic recovery roadmap. Thank you. So we're going to move on to councillor question time. Councillors, do you have any questions you'd like to put to the officers? Not seeing anything. Is anyone? No, there are no questions. All right, let's move on to, well, we were, the next item is sealing schedule, but we don't have anything to seal tonight. So let's move on to uh, seven, which is our petitions and joint letters agenda item. We have two petitions to consider tonight. Uh, so we're going to start with 7.1, which is the petition for basketball blighting at the Peanut Farm Reserve. Councillors, are there any questions of the officers in relation to this report? Question from Councillor Consolo. Thank you. 
Can I, Council Officer, please advise why Monday through Friday is listed as the option? And on point six, it refers to two nights typically use. Is that within Monday through Friday as well, please? I believe we're going to go to Anthony Trail on this one. Thank you, and through you, Madam Mayor. Um, Monday to Friday is chosen uh, because we have weekend daylight for informal recreation. Uh, that also Monday to Friday aligns with our current arrangement with the Peanut Farm Oval, which is adjacent to this uh, netball court facility. Uh, the, the netball use from a sporting permitted use is part of that Monday to Friday uh, allocation as per the resolution uh, proposed. Great. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, councillors, we do have an officer's recommendation. Would someone like to move this or something different? Uh, Councillor Bond to move. Councillor Pearl to second. Councillor Bond. With apologies to Councillor Martin. Um, yeah. Oh, just, sorry, I've called it. That's all right. That's all right. Um, I'm sure he'll he'll speak. Um, just uh, on these particular netball courts, they've been wonderful since they were built a few years ago. They are heavily utilised. However, I just need to caution that there are residents in this area who have contacted uh, myself to provide feedback that they believe um, there's excessive noise coming from these courts at night, particularly in summer um, when daylight savings are on. Um, they believe you know, the, the bouncing of the basketballs, the skateboarding, the setting, setting up of skateboard ramps, um, music that associated with, with the, the use of these courts um, has been disturbing many of the residents across the road. So it is not just a, a straightforward um, yeah, you know, let's just turn the lights on and, and that's it. The problem's solved because there are concerns of residents who live nearby that we need to to take into account and and deal with it and come up with a uh, resolution that is satisfactory to the to the residents from across the road as well as the people who wish to use the courts at night. So it's it's a little bit more complex than it actually may seem to some. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. No, is that a no, Councillor Pearl? You don't need to speak. Yeah, no, no. Okay, Councillor Martin, would you like to speak? Madam Mayor, I've been involved with recreation of the Peanut Farm for well over forty years, and can I congratulate previous councillors and previous council officers on the amazing job that they've done in developing the area behind the pavilion at the Peanut Farm? It's a fantastic area for young and not so young people to be involved in sport during daylight hours. These new lights will allow it to be used effectively up till 9 p.m. on most evenings. Um, I do accept Councillor Bond's caution there, as, as there are some, there are a few people who do abuse the privilege of using that area behind the peanut farm in some way, in, in behind the peanut farm pavilion. In some ways, having the lights there till nine o'clock at night may actually discourage any sort of antisocial behaviour and actually lead to more effective use of it. I also note that Councillor Consolo's comments about weekend use. The peanut farm pavilion is heavily used, as is the peanut farm playing reserve at weekends with football and cricket. And there would, may well be a clash between users on one side of the pavilion and those people try to use the other side of the pavilion. So I would strongly encourage council to endorse a weekday only use of the lighting. And perhaps in 12 months time, we can then revisit whether that's been successful, and whether we need to cut back those hours or whether we wish to extend it to weekends. But really support the officer's current recommendation. Councillor Consolo. Thank you. I appreciate the comments made and respect that there are neighbouring properties that would be affected. So getting the balance right is uh, important. Uh, finding a place for young adults and teenagers on weekends that involves ideally, you know, pickup game basketball is something I think we should encourage. So I get that during the day that can be available or it might have a conflict with the footy there. But um, a few hours into the evening also seems like a good idea. So let's see how it goes during the week, but uh, perhaps leave it open for the uh, weekends too, please. Uh, I believe I put myself in the speaking queue. Um, mine is to uh, support uh, this uh, petition that we would uh, trial it from Monday to Friday till 9 p.m. But mine is to ask the people who are using these spaces, which is wonderful, we want you to use our spaces, but to pick up your litter 
I often walk through there and unfortunately there is always a lot of litter left over from the activities that have occurred there the night before. So that would be a nice thing to uh, respect the space that um, provided by uh, council for everyone to use, not just um, yourselves. Do I sound like a school mum? But anyway, that's my two cents worth. Uh, Councillor Sarah Koff, just, would you like to speak? Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I would like to um, support the uh, motion put forward and, and currently just leave it from Monday to Friday. Um, uh, the um, issue about weekends, this is only really over the um, uh, winter months as, as uh, we come into uh, the uh, uh, the um, hours of the day getting longer, coming into spring and summer. I think that, you know, that people who want to play um, um, on the basketball courts during the warmer months, we'll be able to play into the um, hours of the early hours of the evening. So I don't see this as a big issue at the moment. Um, and that given the 12 months trial or something like that, um, we can work out if, um, you know, how things really work out. Thanks. Would any other councillor like to speak to the motion? If not, Councillor Bond, would you like to close? No. All right, let's, oh, sorry, yeah, I can't see you all on my screen at the one time. Uh, I will now put that motion under division and call upon each of you for your vote. Councillor Bond? Uh, four. Councillor Clark? Four. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Consolo? One. Councillor Martin? Four. Councillor Pearl? In favour. Councillor Sirikoff? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. The motion is carried. We're moving on to item 7.2, which is the uh, petition, objection to the approved permit and planned removal of a significant tree at 3 Charles Street, St Kilda. Councillors, are there any questions of the officers in relation to the report? I have a question. I, I cannot find the photos that were sent through to us. Sorry, I can't find my thing. My question is, there were, there were two um, speakers that spoke of the tree pushing the fence and then the other one saying it wasn't. So I guess, I, I, do we have any officers insight into what is actually the case in this situation? Uh, I think I'm calling on Anthony. No, who am I calling on? Uh, Mark Jay or Lisa Davis? Yes, um, hello through you, Mayor. Uh, Mark Jay here. Um, I can confirm there were some photos and evidence provided with the submission that did show damage to boundary fencing and the paving and surrounding structures um, and they were taken into consideration with the uh, original assessment. Okay. Are there any other questions for officers? I may ask one more question. Under our current uh, uh, tree removal permit, do we have any requirement for them to replace the tree, uh, perhaps with a different root system that would, um, that is that a requirement under our current system? Through you, Mayor. Um, I can confirm that the permit that was initially issued did not include um, the requirement for a replacement tree. Um, however, that could certainly be considered and is uh, something that we do take into consideration with uh, many of the permits that we issue. If it's um, a space that um, can cater for a further tree, we certainly um, encourage that by permit condition wherever possible. And could I follow up on that, Mr. Jay? Is is this area uh, suitable for a replacement tree? Obviously, not perhaps the identical species. Yes, through you, Mayor. Um, I can confirm that um, there is potential for a replacement tree um, if um, this was deemed um, suitable to be removed um, by a further assessment. Absolutely, there could be a replacement tree by permit condition. Thank you. Are there any other questions, councillors? Uh, if not, uh, we have an officer's recommendation. Would someone like to move this to something different? Councillor Copsey to move it. Sorry, Madam Mayor, I'm not sure if you can see my question. You don't have a question up there. I'm not sure. Sorry, we'll go back to that. Uh, but you, for some reason, it has not appeared. Sorry. Uh, um, yep. I just wanted to clarify 
I believe that I've seen conflicting advice about the health of the tree. Could officers just clarify the arborists or the what we understand to be the health or otherwise of this tree, please? Is that Mark Joe? Is that you again? Um, yes, through you, Mayor. Um, I can confirm that the initial assessment um, did include a referral to um, a council arborist who did uh, provide comments on the health of the tree, um, which he uh, determined to uh, say that it was displaying some symptoms of poor health and uh, was looking at uh, deterioration um, and that there was some significant sparse canopy that was evident as well. Okay, so we're going to move to Councillor Cotsey. You want to move an alternate recommendation? Do you want to read that out? Yes, please. Sorry, I'm just getting it up. So the alternate recommendation, oh, thank you, it's on the screen now. The Council, uh, I'll, I'll just read the changes. Um, at number two, um, adds to the end of that sentence, and as such, the tree cannot be removed at this point in time. Substitute point three reading notes that officers have commissioned an independent arborist to review the decision to issue permit 69-2021 ST dash ST. And this will include undertaking an assessment of the health of the tree, any risks, its presence and its amenity value. And point four notes that the outcome of the independent review once completed will be communicated to petitioners, the applicant and councillors. Do we have a seconder for this? Do we, uh, Councillor Baxter, to second. Okay, Councillor Copsey. Thank you. So this, um, the effect of this alt rec is is not substantially different from the officer's recommendation. Just includes a bit um, of an update about where the process is at in terms of the commissioning um, of the independent um, review and also just a little bit further clarity around the status of the tree currently um, so that's clear to community and also what the next steps will be i hope councillors will support that i'm just seeking to get a bit more information into the recommendation so that it's clear uh, for the community what's happening here councillor baxter oh yeah look i think it just makes things clearer Could I ask a clarifying question then before I could pose a possible amendment? In fact, uh, Mr. J, I, I, I mentioned that a replacement tree, would this be the point if there was interest in that or that would come out as a possibility as part of this process to ha uh, include a replacement tree? Where would be the appropriate place for that to be considered? Yeah, through you, Mayor. Um, at the conclusion of the um, next assessment that will take place after we've received uh, an independent arborist's report uh, regarding the health of the existing tree, um, it would happen at the end of that process and be part of that uh, next decision. So we don't, just to clarify, we don't need to do, I don't need to amend now as that as a possibility. That's correct. It doesn't need to be considered now. Thank you very much. Uh, would anyone else like to speak to the motion? There are Councillor Copsey, would you like to close? I'll just thank those who've come and um, presented uh, both views on this topic tonight um, and thank those community members who have shown um, interest in, uh, you know, in, in the condition of this tree and what's going to happen to it in the future. Um, I'm pleased that there is an opportunity here for uh, a bit of further scrutiny uh, in response to some of the community concerns that are raised and look forward to um, seeing where the advice lands following the arborists' uh, review of this decision. Thank you. Councillor Zana, I'll put this motion under division. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. The motion is carried. 
So that's the end of the petitions. We're moving on to uh, agenda items 8 to 14, which is the presentation of reports. So we're starting with 9.1, which is the Sports Surface Operating Guidelines and Outdoor Sports Lighting Operating Guidelines. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers in relation to this report? Uh, Councillor Clark. Yes, I have a couple of questions. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, could an officer provide me with an understanding of how this policy, um, which, which is a good initiative to be able to extend the lighting and the use of our sporting fields, but we've already had one petition or discussion tonight about um, potential conflict with residents and users of these um, sporting areas. So how, how do the council officers envisage this policy resolving conflict uh, where it exists because I note the policy is about investing in the lighting, which is great, uh, and that we should open this up to uh, the community, but it doesn't seem to have any guidelines around how we would recognise and deal with potential conflicts. Anthony Trail. Yep, to you, Madam Mayor. The, um... The primary intent of these guidelines is to capture the, the ways of working we have been doing on capital and previous petitions that have been before council. Um, we have had uh, petitions inquiries from Lagoon Reserve and Penup Farm Ovals around trying to get joint use. So this, uh, these guidelines are trying to give the balance of uh, sports grounds whilst they have a primary use for sport and when permitted that we, with this infrastructure that council has been investing in, can also service broader benefits. So that's what this guideline does allow us to achieve. It also helps guide our capital investment, so especially sports lighting, which uh, council's done a significant amount over the last three or four years, where we're improving uh, through that capital investment, the safety of sports participation by getting higher lux levels uh, lighting and better spread across the ground. But it's also with LED technology being uh, pointed towards the oval, which is, making sure we're compliant with Australian standards and the light spill outside of the plain areas uh, does not impact the surrounding residents like old halogen flood lighting technology used to. So sorry, just to clarify that then, uh, I guess where there does become residents' concerns or conflict that isn't covered in this, if this is more about a capital investment program. Yes, thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. So, utilising these guidelines on these conflicts, uh, where we do have current sports ground lighting, it opens up the opportunities because we know the amenity impacts of, of lighting spill is uh, not as great as halogen uh, or technology, and we're just managing uh, the associated things like use and rubbish and noise, as sort of uh, raised a little bit earlier. Um, sites where we don't have that lighting uh, doesn't lend to sort of um, those arrangements have uh, been able to be put in place and tested. I just have one other question, Madam Mayor, although I'm happy to wait till late. No, 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 please continue. And I'm just wondering, um, as a follow up, where would we understand the costs of once we turn not the capital investment in terms of the installing the lighting, but the ongoing cost of turning the lighting on from five to nine, if it's not a sporting club that's actually providing some funding for that. Uh, Anthony Trail, is that you again? Yep, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, as a, through our capital, as a, as a guide, uh, lighting costs are cheaper when we chain transfer from halogen to LED. So uh, we are finding the operating costs with that capital technology being uh, cheaper. Um, with our sporting licences and leases, uh, we have uh, we do need to separate the costs of when we make it available to broad community use. That would be um, a cost of council, but the uh, sports lighting would be picked up uh, by the user group that is permitted that activity. Sure, but there's no cost in here of what it would cost to turn on these lights for four hours. I'm making from five to nine, for example. Uh, correct, yes, because uh, the lighting would change based around the, the lux levels and the particular size. So uh, a typical oval, you could sort of uh, have a cost around you know, 30 to 40 
dollars an hour with uh, new technology, but a netball court is smaller um, and not using as much space. So that would drop into the probably about half that price. Um, but we're trying to get meters uh, on each and have technology that allows us to do zones uh, to sort of personalize the lighting for ongoing operational costs, but also um, targeted for the need of that use at that particular time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Copsey. Thank you. My query was around um, what data officers are seeking to consider in assessing potential heat island and microplastic impacts on council land uh, and stormwater runoff from synthetic and hybrid fields. I'm pleased to see that consideration in there, but I'm just curious about what data we're going to be um, seeking and assessing in order to make that um, that that assessment and also how this information is going to be conveyed back to council um, throughout the project, but also particularly at end of life of the of the um, hybrid surface. Anthony Trail. Thank you, and through you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, the policy has gone into uh, you know, a lot of detail about the environmental factors that we will consider depending on what surface we choose, and um, you know, we've got. Uh, three options of synthetic hybrid and natural turf that we would uh, look to use. Um, in terms of uh, the, the question, uh, we, we'd look, we'd envision to engage an independent consultant to peer review our first trial project, uh, which is a um, in our council plan and council budget uh, of a, a rectangular a synthetic at JL Murphy Reserve. Um, we've chosen that as a, as a best location based around the surrounding landscape, the demand of use, the growth in female and junior sports and the introduction of a school where we'd be able to manage and the off-season use that that particular site currently has. Um, we That consultant would test our environmental factors as documented in this, uh, which would include some post-construction inspections, uh, probably quarterly for a 12 month period. Um, something like heat island effect would be checking temperature on that reserve at different stages of the year on the synthetic, the surrounds the synthetic and on the adjacent neighbouring natural pitch um, with and inspections of waterways in terms of microplastics going around. Um, that would be um, reported back 12 months after the construction of that project, either through a CEO report article or a public report on the outcomes that was achieved from that particular project. Just ask a follow up on that, please, Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Trail. That sounds good. Um, particularly around end of life, I I'm uh, wondering if there's any consideration in there um, around impacts on the ground itself or council um, grounds and land. Um, but, you know, just to put it in plain speak, I'm concerned about there being um, chemical or microplastic um, articles left in the surface uh, and whether there's a mechanism planned in order to, um, to check that and, and to monitor it. Anthony Trail. Thank you, and through you, Madam Mayor. Yes, there would be um, uh, testing of the, the microplastics. Uh, it's also the, the waste of the synthetic at the end of the useful life. They generally carry a 10 year, and technology has come a long way in synthetics from the uh, first phase of that. Um, we're now starting to see the introduction of you know, uh, better disposal uh, strategies around the end of useful life. Uh, so, yeah, we'll be looking to uh, introduce. You know, introduce that. Uh, they're not readily available in Australia, but we'll be looking to sort of you know, introduce those elements as part of this particular project as well. Uh, Councillor Sirikoff. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just following up on Council, Councillor Clark's question regarding uh, lighting. Uh, with the, if we've got automation for lighting, say from five o'clock to nine o'clock, do we also have any technology built into that automation so that the lighting is um, sensitive to um, darkness and lightness as you know as we go through the um, months of the months of the year so that uh, lighting will automatically switch on as it's getting to a certain luminosity or darkness. Anthony Trail. Through you, Madam Mayor, um, currently we've um, been installing timers to control uh, lighting uh, in situations where we've had lighting left overnight by sports club users. Uh, however, in our uh, capital 
Council plan, we've got uh, the, the plan to do some sports central control um, of this lighting, which allows um, you know, sports clubs and control to do a couple of things. One is to change the dim, the, the levels of lux levels based around the use uh, from a central control thing uh, and the ability to test those environments and have sensors as part of that. So that is a potential uh, allocated program in the four year outlook. Um, but our first priority is to get timers to ensure lights aren't left on longer than anticipated um, to protect the amenity and support the user groups. And going forward, um, you know, we'll be able to introduce that technology. Uh, Councillor Consolo. Thank you. In item 4.16, these guidelines are, it says that the guidelines are specific for sporting reserves and do not consider dedicated dog park lighting. And I know at Lagoon Reserve, we've had the issue that the sporting club that was there has stopped attending for the moment being because the service isn't great. Is this one of those situations where these guidelines might change the arrangement because it's just for community use now. Um, I guess I'm just trying to secure that, that the dog users can still use it if there's no other booking at the moment. Anthony Trail. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, Lagoon Reserve is for a primary purpose of uh, sports participation. So that qualifies under these uh, policy and guidelines. Uh, the out of scope is probably in reference to a site like Eastern Reserve, uh, which is a, a dedicated dog park. So that would require its own policy or guideline position. Um, but yeah, Lagoon and Council does have an active current project uh, looking at the surface uh, to maintain as a sports at Lagoon and support dog walking and other activities. So that will remain a primary purpose uh, sports ground and therefore this lighting guidelines apply there. Any other questions, councillors? If not, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover for this or something different? I'm happy to move it. Do I have a seconder? Uh, and uh, councillor Bond to second. I'll, I'll reserve my right to speak, councillor Bond. Um, you know, I think it's probably agreed by everyone that our sporting fields and um, playing surfaces are becoming increasingly congested and increasingly used and utilised. And we're seeing that right across Port Phillip. Um, one of the solutions is to have more time at night with more lighting, which sort of touches on something we spoke about earlier. It does have ramifications and implications on, on local residents. So um, whilst it's great we have these guidelines, we do need to ensure that they comply and the, the needs of local residents surrounding these sporting fields are, are taking into account as we deal with the, the increased uh, usage of our sporting fields across all of Port Phillip. Councillor Consola, did you want to speak to the motion? Sure, yes. Thank you to the officers for putting together these guidelines. They're very important. We're seeing situations where secondary schools are going to don't have their own uh, ovals and are depending on our top our sites so we need to make sure that they're ready to take on that extra use uh technology is great to to have cost savings and make sure those lights are turned off at night to not disturb people so i welcome all the, the advances there it is important and i'm glad that this these guidelines respect that it's not only for organized sport and involving the community because in the winter some people do want to get out after they get home from work and just whether that's do a little training or throw a frisbee or walk their dog, that it can allow for some lighting and for some safety. So thank you. Councillor Martin. As most of you know, I've been involved in sporting activities in Port Phillip, but I think I've run up and down virtually every green space in Port Phillip multiple times over the last 50 years. So I have a vested interest in, in this motion. Can I A, congratulate the council officers in putting together a very, very comprehensive document? And secondly, can I thank Councillor Copti and Councillor Consolo for their questions because they're very, very pertinent questions. And can I thank Mr. Trail for his excellent answers? Um, I'd like to comment on two things. Some of you may be aware that I had the, the pleasure, I suppose, of managing quite a large oval at a primary school over the last 20 years where we had extreme difficulties in trying to maintain the turf because there was so much usage. And after much debate, we finally three years ago moved towards a synthetic surface. Unlike the synthetic surfaces that we had 10 and 15 years ago, the current surfaces 
are far more environmentally friendly. They don't act as heat islands. And the big issue for the school that I worked is, it's not the fact that we've put in something that's very useful. It's used not just for sport, but by the children all the time. We just need that, that group needs to make sure that at the end of its usable life, it's removed effectively as Councillor, as Councillor Crawford, no, Councillor Copty has asked and as Mr. Trail has assured us. The thing that I'd like to comment about is lighting and I welcome the comments of Mr. Trail that we're going to look at some sort of automatic fencing of our lighting. There's nothing worse than getting a phone call at 8.30 on a rainy night. Could I go down to the local sporting pavilion and turn off the lights, which I've had to do on a regular basis. I think that the council officers have, have covered all bases here. I think this is an excellent document and I hope we all support it. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? If then, I, I don't need to close, so let's put that to the vote. Councillor Copsey? Four. Councillor Crawford? Four. Councillor Consolo? Four. Councillor Martin? Four. Councillor Pearl? In favour. Councillor Sirikoff? Four. Councillor Baxter? Four. Councillor Bond? Four. Councillor Clark? Oh. The motion is carried. Moving on to 10.1, which is good design guide for buildings in flood affected areas of Fisherman's Bend, Arden and Macaulay. Councillors, do we have any questions for the officers? If not, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover of, some, of this? Councillor Pearl to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Consolo. Councillor Pearl. Just quickly, happy to note this. I agree with most of what's in the report. Keep in mind, Fisherman's Bend was built on where the Yarra River once flowed and was previously a swamp. So if you're designing a city, probably not the obvious place to start building high-rise buildings. Um, but that's not the way this has worked out. It's, it's heavily reclaimed land. The area floods regularly as is. Um, and as that built up and more um, solid surfaces get put through what is already pretty marginal country in many respects, uh, it's important that we have frameworks and guidelines in place to mitigate against um, the existing flooding that's already there uh, and the future flooding that is to come. Happy to support it. Councillor Consolo. Thank you. This is a really exciting document in my um, view. The um, flooding is a big issue in this area. And often when you have the minimum height set plus the freeboard, you get this level that's a bit high. And so without these guidelines, people might meet that, but then we start having the urban design or urban design outcomes where it's sort of like, how do you get up that little bit extra level? Or, so these guidelines are really high quality examples showing where you can integrate it a little bit more for access for all and for the human scale and make it a more pleasant, inviting in, um, area. So I think it's important that we spend money on mitigation, not just on response uh, for flooding. So this initial investment can help create a better public realm where it meets the private realm uh, and also help with this future flooding. So I am really impressed that these guidelines have been put together and hope everyone supports it tonight. Uh, Councillor Copsey. Thank you. Yes, I'm really pleased to see this document um, come through for adoption. It's a vital piece of work. Um, we are aware already that portions of our city are already flood prone. And as we um, go further into experiencing the impacts of the climate crisis, that is likely to worsen. Um, so it's definitely something that we need to contemplate in planning for our city. And this design, I think, is a really practical one to work with um, developers and applicants around what the expectations are of buildings that are not just functional in a um, water sensitive city, uh, but don't lead to some of the poorer design outcomes that we've seen in the past of large blank walls fronting the street and inaccessible um, entryways. So I really um, appreciate all of the work from the offices that's gone into creating what I think is, I, I believe is a user friendly guide that I hope will um, produce better outcomes uh, in partnership with those who are doing development in our city. And I think it's absolutely vital, as has been touched on, that this guide really seeks to create that intersection between uh, flood response, but also good design. And as was mentioned, accessibility, because that's the other thing that can really suffer as we've seen. And we want to enable a space 
um, in our city where everybody has dignified and convenient access to buildings, no matter their abilities. So really pleased to see this come through. Um, and I also just wanted to acknowledge tonight the hard work and attention that former Mayor Bernadine Voss gave to this um, issue. I know that she was absolutely passionate about it and it's great to see um, this guideline uh, emerge as a result of all the work that's been done over successive years. Thanks. Um, I'll briefly speak. I'm not uh, Councillor Consolo and, and Councillor Copsey have captured most of what I thought, but it, it strikes me that this guide is really um, a very uh, picture-based uh, guide of do's and don'ts, and we would encourage all developers to go for the do's because there's some beautiful outcomes, as we've seen um, examples in other cities uh, and in Melbourne itself, and Fisherman's Bend is an amazing uh, visionary place, and we would like to reach that potential. Uh, and so some of the public realm outcomes uh, when it meets the public I mean, the private are exceptional uh, in the examples given. And yeah, I, I commend the officers for this work and, and I look forward to the developments that live up to these expectations in the future. Councillor Ksirikov. Uh, thank, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm totally in support of these um, really um, great sort of um, guidelines um, because uh, what we want uh, fishermen being to be a great place to live and work in. And um, I think it's a great uh, direction so that we don't end up where we have been with um, areas around um, Elwood Canal and the mitigation we're still, um, we're still facing trying to uh, resolve the problems of flooding in that area. So I think this is a great step forward. Would any other councillors like to speak to the motion? Councillor Pearl, would you like to close? Let's put that to the vote. Uh, Councillor Crawford, four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Uh, Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. The motion is carried. Moving on to 10.2, which is the awarding of carpentry and handyman services panel contract. Councillors, do you have any questions for the officers? If not, I have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover, Councillor Copsey, Councillor Pearl to second? Councillor Copsey. Reserve, thanks. Councillor Pearl? No, thanks. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Let's go back to you, Councillor Copsey. Yes, there's not much need to close. Thanks to the officers for their work on this. Let's put that to the vote. All those in favour by division. Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin. Four. Four. Thank you. Councillor Pearl. In favour. Councillor Sirikoff. Four. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. And Councillor Consolo. Four. The motion is carried. Now it is item 12.1, which is the draft business parklet policy guidelines and fee structure. Councillors, do we have any questions for the officers? Councillor Clark. I was just wondering if the officers could clarify, um, there's a reference to an expression of interest process, which is um, clearly going to be important in Mormon Road at Elwood. And I just wanted to understand if they could provide some more detail on how that expression of interest will work and what is the considerations for determining who gets a parklet in light of probably more demand than uh, opportunity on Ormond Road and uh, so what are those considerations in terms of how those parklets would be um, awarded through this expression of interest please. Uh, Lauren Bilkower. Through you, Mayor, um, there are a number of criteria expressed in the, the draft guidelines um, as to how any application would be assessed um, and details of the panel, the internal panel that would assess them. So all applications received um, from traders would be assessed against those criteria by the panel and a set of recommendations made in accordance um, you know, with who um, meets the criteria to the, the best ability. Um, and then those um, applications would be reviewed on an annual basis um, should those traders um, wish to renew their, 
their permits. Sorry, could I just yes. clarify that? So um, I have read all the documents, uh, but could you just clarify what is that criteria, please? Absolutely. Through you, Mayor, so it's on um, page 251 of the draft guidelines. So um, the the items we'd consider is effect on traffic flows and safety, effect on local car parking, effect on pedestrian flows and safety, impact on neighbouring businesses, impact on the appearance of the street and its surroundings, impact on residential amenity, duration of use, compatibility with other uses in the street, the number of other existing or proposed parklets within the area, whether it's complementary to the primary adjoining use, whether it's less intensive than the primary adjoining use, the applicant's previous record of compliance, any relevant policies of the council and any other matter relevant to the application. Council, sorry, sorry, could, oh, sorry to Madam Mayor, but I just wanted to, if you've got, if that uh, criteria is obviously good. However, if you've got 20 hospitality businesses in Ormond Road wanting a parklet and there, there's going to have to be a further, uh, you know, criteria is going to have to be further detailed, I guess, to be able to explain how one was awarded over the other, uh, I would have thought, because that, that high level uh, criteria probably doesn't allow for how you determine between two hospitality businesses in a similar part of the road or um, or both actually wanting one and there's just not enough space. Um, through you, Mayor, the next page of the guidelines, which is um, page 252, also goes through um, further elements of assessment. Um, for example, um, community benefit, where we would look at hours of operation, permanent seating, um, artwork or creative contribution being made, public facilities, for example, bicycle stands, um, design and general aesthetic measures, risk management measures, um, community support letters, so um, who had support from neighbouring businesses um, and could demonstrate community support, um, considering the need of people, um, considering the needs of all people, including age, gender, cultural background and ability. Um, and so we would obviously be, be looking to provide um, a range of opportunities for the public so that we had public, uh, parklets available um, and utilised and activated as, as much as possible. Thank you. Councillor Consolo. Thank you. I have two questions. The first one is, if we endorse this policy tonight, uh, will we have an op another opportunity to freeze the rate, say COVID keeps going on and we have a different thinking process a few months down the road? Uh, through you, Mayor, absolutely, yes. This is only endorsing that we send these documents out for community consultation tonight. Um, we can still discuss um, potential fee waivers down the track if Council wish to consider that. Right. Thank you. And on further with um, Councillor Clarks, uh, about the appeal process, and I can see where you have criteria to who can get the parklets, but with the appeal process, or maybe it's a step before that, if the neighbouring properties don't uh, support it, so say you have a bar next to a bar and that first bar says, no, we're not going to agree to you having a car spot because, you know, for various reasons, is that part of the appeal process that they could come um, or do they stop their application there that they don't have the support of their neighbouring properties so therefore they can't keep going or will it be brought up to the appeal process internally to review? Uh, through you, Mayor, we currently do review um, situations where traders come to us unable to gain the support of their neighbouring businesses. So yes, that could be part of the appeal process. Um, and, and certainly if they could demonstrate community support um, in lieu of having the support of their neighbours, that's something we could consider. Um, at, the, at, at present with the trial officers have, have done their best to uh, work with traders where they haven't been able to seek support from their neighbours, going to meet with the, the neighbours and seeing if we can broker solutions as well. Are there Thank any you very much. Are there further questions from councillors? If not, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Or, yep, Councillor Copsey to move. Uh, uh, Councillor Bond to second. Councillor Copsey. Sir, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bond. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I support the extension of the parklets. Um, we've seen some great additions uh, as well as some quality um, 
outcomes in areas in and around Port Phillip. Some of the traders have really gone to great effort to to build a very comfortable and a very welcoming um, parklet outside of their business. And others sort of put one up um, rather quickly just to suit a purpose at the time. Um, I think one of the next steps that need to form part of these guidelines is how we deal with these parklets going forward. Because at the moment, the overwhelming majority of them are still temporary um, and have been put up for the purpose of being taken down. So I guess the question is, and it should form part of this policy and part of this discussion, is what do we want our streetscapes and and shopping strips to look like in 12 months' time, 18 months, two years' time? And, and how do we want these parklets to play a role within our shopping strips, whether it's either removed or, or become a permanent fixture in those particular areas? Um, one of the areas that comes to mind for me is Blessington Street in St Kilda, where all of the businesses there put out a little outdoor dining area. They took over the park, car park and, and it looks wonderful, except what you have is um, lots of little boxes in the car park. So it looks a little bit like a, a sale yard, series of sale yard pens. I think there's a, there's a place or a role for council to play to ensure that all these outdoor parklets integrate um, much better than they currently do into our streetscapes and, and form a a future part of the streetscape to these particular areas like you know, Blessington Street and out the front of the ESPY where you've got the Esplanade Hotel and, and Itchy Knee, their area there. What What's the future of that? So um, I think that should be certainly be a, a part of this discussion going forward. I'm not so keen on the, the complex fee structure proposed. Um, I think I've said it many times that our outdoor trading, and this should be included in our outdoor trading guidelines, should just be a flat fee per table and a flat fee per chair across the entire municipality like they do in the city of Yarra. Um, I think the way we've structured our outdoor dining fees and by extension our outdoor parklet fees is just so complex um, that there's not going to be too many people who will be able to to understand it. I think the flat rate is a better way to go forward. But so, you know, this policy is not ideal in, as far as I'm concerned, but it's or not perfect, but it, you know, it will get us through the next 12 months until we decide, until we have a better indication of what's going to happen with regard to COVID trading requirements for businesses and how we treat these areas um, going forward. So, yeah, certainly support these. Uh, Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin, we can't hear you. Um, uh, no, comments have been made. I don't, I don't need to comment. Don't need to comment. Um, would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Uh, Councillor Copsey. I believe Councillor Sirikoff wants to speak to the motion. Okay, if you're willing to go to that, given up the time, Councillor Sirikoff. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just see that the uh, parklets have been a, um, a wonderful saviour for small and large businesses, for our cafes, our bars, our restaurants. And uh, during these devastating uh, COVID times, and now especially with um, with all of these ongoing uh, uh, lockdowns, um, some areas are, I've seen that some areas of Port Phillip have totally welcomed parklets, while some have not been so enthusiastic because of the different needs for businesses to operate on their high streets. And I hope this will all be sorted out even further over time. And um, there's also been some contention or uh, with um, public spaces where parklets have been seen to be uh, completely appropriate and in other areas they've been not so appropriate. So I see this uh, draft par uh, parklet policy as trying to find the right balance between business parklets and public amenity and especially by customising the demands for business parklets on each individual high street and still providing amenity to footpaths, roads and car parking spaces. I also have a little bit of um, concerns about the uh, fee structures, but I hope that the um, businesses will um, give us feedback on if, how appropriate they are. And so I support the, uh, I do support the business park policy to keep our businesses thriving as a part of a, a COVID recovery and to get our community out and about and enjoying and supporting our dining precincts. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Copsey. 
you. Uh, just to say that it's been um, wonderful to see the uptake of some really excellent parklets in the city over this last period. It's been one of those, it's been a really, really tough couple of years, but it's been wonderful to see um, the activation that some of these spaces have provided. And indeed, they've been so popular uh, with business and with the users and community um, that we're in a position now of having to, uh, the happy position of having to consider a policy for how we manage this use of public space going forward. Um, so tonight we are endorsing these guidelines for going out for a consultation. Um, I urge everybody who's been users of the parklets to um, participate in this. Let us know what you've liked, what you haven't. Um, if the criteria that council are proposing to assess here are the correct ones, because obviously there's so many benefits um, from increased activ activation uh, to our public spaces as well. But there's also tension um, because we are a big, growing, thriving municipality. So let us know how we're going. And I also just wanted to take this opportunity to thank the CEO and team for their incredibly, I'm going to use an overused word, nimble uh, and very responsive um, measures that were taken when we were early in the days of responding to COVID-19. And we really were uh, a quick mover in this space. Um, I really thank the CEO and team for their expertise in helping us to have a project that's gone quite well so far. Some hiccups, but um, it's been overwhelmingly successful and I hope that we'll continue to see that success. So thank you very much. Let's put that to the vote uh, by division. Councillor Pearl. Five. Councillor Sirikoff. In favour. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. The motion is carried. All right, so it's 12.2 uh, item, which is the Skyline Ferris wheel application. Councillors, do we have any questions for uh, um, the officers? Uh, uh, just, just to, we'll go to the questions if, if I could first, CEO, and then we'll come to that point that you've made to me. Uh, any questions for the officers? I have some, if I may, um, uh, and I believe it is Lauren Bilkow who also take the questions on this one. Um, I know that there has been some uh, concern about the location, and, and I do understand that we've applied to dwell before to um, perhaps uh, locate the Ferris wheel on the other side of the seabards on the uh, in the car park. I was just wondering. What were the reasons that Dwelp gave for that not being possible? And do you think it's possible that they would reconsider that? Uh, through you, Mayor, there's no reason to believe that Dwelp would be supportive of the site a second time around. Uh, they had significant concerns about potential impacts to the coastal vegetation, and there were also concerns around weight loading issues. Um, in addition, councillors are aware that Parks Victoria will be rebuilding the St Kilda Pier over the next three years, and we're concerned these works would be in conflict with the Ferris wheel should it be placed in this lo location and therefore mitigate its success. Councillor Consolo. Thank you. Two questions. The first one, are, is the Ferris wheel lit up at night? Uh, through you, Meg, yes, the Ferris wheel is lit up at night. Um, the, the Ferris wheel has fully programmable LED lighting, so it is lit up at night and can be done in, in any colours, but certainly if there are any concerns about that, um, it can also be changed or switched off very quickly. Thank you. And second question, is there a second location proposed um, if people are supportive of this idea but not in that exact location outside what Dwelp's already said no to? Um, through you, Mayor, we haven't been able to ascertain an appropriate second location, unfortunately. Um, obviously, looking at um, locations like the Triangle car park would result in significant revenue loss um, due to car parking over that six month period. Um, any of the locations around the pier are problematic due to the, the works being done at the pier over the next three years. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have a viable alternate location if this one is not approved. Um, if I could ask another question, please, Lauren. Um, 
uh, where if there were people queuing to go on it, I'm not quite clear on how that would work. Would there be queues then out across South Beach Reserve or is it more contained within that 5% of area? Um, through you, Mayor Skyline has space for queuing within the footprint requested using their front deck area. Um, so they'll not be taking any public walkways up with the footprint or queuing areas. The front deck area can hold 60 people in a queue, socially distanced, pending restrictions in place at the time. If I may ask one more question, please. Um, so we've had uh, Ferris wheels on the foreshore in this sort of area before. Have we had any major problems with them or have they been positively received as far as we know in terms of noise and light complaints or um, turf damage, anything like that? Um, through you, Mayor, um, previously when we have had the Ferris wheel in South Beach Reserve, um, we have had no complaints, um, no amenity issues or complaints, no noise complaints, no complaints through lights um, and no unexpected damage to turf. So overall, a very good experience previously. Uh, Councillor Clark. So I just wanted to, I've seen the Ferris wheel there. I just want to clarify, uh, has it been there during summer or has it previously been there during the winter months? Uh, through you, Mayor, previously it has been there between March and May, so not not summer, but still warmer months. Thank you. Are there any further questions for the officers? Um, okay. So uh, our CEO would like to make a comment in regards to the uh, suggestion re recommendation officer's recommendation so through you through you mayor, I think we just probably need to clarify and again, can either do this as an old mech or from officers or councils may wish to amend whether the extension needs to be brought back to council or not or it's under delegation that's in the event a one plus one year extension is granted i'd, I'd recommend that that's actually brought back to council for consideration rather than done under delegation just as part two just talks about the possibility I think would help this motion. We put a part 3.3 .3 that required that extension to come back to council if the council wished to consider that. So in terms of a, a process, would we would officers just recommend that now? Uh, or should I we just put it and then amend? Um, I'll be guided by Kirsty Peace, but I'm happy to do an alternate officer's recommendation if you consent to that, Mayor, which would be a 3.3. Uh, that, uh, any, that, any, that any permit for an extension be brought back to council for consideration. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree uh, to that. Oh, sorry, Councillor. Sorry, Mayor. Sorry. Through you, um, sure. the approach suggested by the CEO is the correct approach. And if he could just repeat the wording and we'll get it up on the screen. That any, that any permit for a, an extension be brought back to council for consideration. That just clarifies what happens after 3.2 mm. All right, councillors, uh, we've got, oh, okay, so Councillor Martin will move the alt rec. Do I have a seconder? I'm happy to second. Uh, Councillor Martin. Well, we heard some very passionate people speak to us during the uh, public um, speaking time. Local trade is passionate to try and bring more people back to our foreshore, to try and get our public more engaged with us at the end of COVID. And they were very, very supportive of this move. So I take on board that there's a strong will amongst the local traders to get our Ferris wheel somewhere on the foreshore so that we can bring people back into, into St Kilda. Secondly, my own experience of the foreshore, particularly during COVID, there have been lots of you know, teenagers, people a little bit younger than me, not so many families as we've seen in previous years. We really need to attract families. And my own experience as a parent, mention the word Ferris wheel. If you have a Ferris wheel, the children will come. Mention was made of the Ferris wheel in Adelaide. I know that uh, if I ever took my children when they were young to the beach in Adelaide, they wanted to go to Glenelg Beach because there was a Ferris wheel there. I took my eldest to London. The first thing he wanted to do was to go on the London Eye straight from the airport. So it's a real attraction for families. So we can bring lots and lots of people who perhaps haven't been to St Kilda in recent years, back to St Kilda to enjoy not just the Ferris wheel, but the wonderful facilities that we offer in the rest of St Kilda, and also to help our local traders get back on their feet after COVID. I do like the alt rec that we do this for 12 months and we as a council make the decision. I think this is a very important decision. And while I would hope that our CEO would have made the correct decision, I think it's something that council should own. 
I note that my preference would be to have the Ferris wheel on some hard stand, possibly somewhere near the St Kilda Pier, but we know that the St Kilda Pier in the next 18 months is going to be an area that won't be particularly amenable to tourists as we have the new developments there. So although we're going to be losing 5% of our green space in the short term, I think the benefits of bringing lots and lots of people into the foreshore and lots of families with money to spend and children to enjoy our facilities, I think that will outweigh the temporary loss of a small amount of green space, which I hopefully will get back, because if the Ferris wheel is going to be there over a longer period, hopefully we'll be able to move it back closer to the St Kilda Pier once the St Kilda Pier developments are completed. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, it's my turn to speak. I think the figure that jumped out at me um, when I've been advocating to uh, other levels of government for support for the St Kilda area um, is that we've had a 78% drop in visitation and also in events that um, been hosted on our foreshore areas, predominantly in the St Kilda area, have gone from about 350 to 50 in the next year. And that's, that's if COVID allows. So uh, an area that is highly dependent on international tourism and visitation from interstate or within our state and, and the lack of movement. Our foreshore is, is in a really tough situation and we heard it from the traders today. And I think, and I'm hoping that you will support this application, that we should do as much as is possible for us to help these traders survive this next year, year and a half. There's a lot of things that our international borders are not opening anytime soon and who knows our internal borders. So if that is supported by the foreshore traders and the traders around on Ackland Street and Fitzroy Street, who are we to stand in the way of a good idea? It's a small amount of land and right now our foreshore is pretty empty because we have 78% less visitation. So let's have the problem where we have too many people at the beach again, behaving well, of course, but that's a different challenge to where we are now to allowing um, our activity centres and our foreshore traders uh, to struggle through. We're still in the middle of winter. We're in another lockdown. The vaccine rollout is slow. And unfortunately, um, and I'm looking forward to further efforts because I have speak, spoken to the minister for um, looking for opportunities to get extra money for events um, and possibilities for the St Kilda area to help support our traders, but we're not there yet. So I urge you councillors to please support uh, this application at a crucial time in our traders history, in St Kilda's history. There are always ups and downs as we heard in the condolence motion together uh, earlier tonight. And I think this is um, one of those really difficult moments that future historians will write about. But I do urge you to um, allow this opportunity, this application to go through so we can see the possibilities of what it brings to St Kilda. Councillor Consolo. Thank you. I will also be supporting this. Uh, we've talked a lot about tonight being family friendly and I think that's true. Uh, but I think maybe lots of first dates or just groups of friends are gonna enjoy it too. Uh, it's great to hear that it's going to be lit up. That's a good attraction. My kids love seeing the Melbourne Star observation wheel from afar. They're really excited about that. And I'm sure all the Instagrammers will also like to snap some, some uh, photos with it. So that's going to draw a good crowd. And yeah, we need to think outside the box. Who knows uh, what's going to happen in the near future. And the international borders, you're right, that they're probably not going to open anytime soon. Or if they do, it's going to be reduced travel. So this area is not going to be at its maximum use as we usually see. So now's a good time, especially with the pier as well being in construction. But like others to encourage others to support this. It might not be the perfect location, but it's the one we have right now. So thank you. Uh, Councillor Copsey. Well, I can fully support the idea behind this. I only wish that this application um, was taking on board some of the concern about taking up a really valuable piece of open space that's already very highly utilised. Uh, I would like to see this application come back uh, with a location that is on hard stand uh, and doesn't compromise a, a really crucial piece of green space that attracts a lot of visitors to, um, to our city in its current form and is already quite highly utilised. I absolutely hear what is being said about the need to um, support local business and council is very keen to do that. Um, I'm really, really keen to see the 
application come back with a thinking around where we can put it, that it won't compromise uh, an area that is already um, a, a significant attractor to our area and to those businesses there locally. The foreshore is an amazing attraction in and of itself uh, and public space around there is very contested. Um, I understand that and I think that there will be a solution for where we can place this without compromising uh, a beautiful place where people already come to enjoy the foreshore and uh, enjoy picnics. Taking into account in um, in my decision not to support this tonight, but I hope to continue discussions um, that I think that there will be a location that won't compromise <laughs> that, that grassed area, but also the length that's proposed here. Um, previously, it's been a good attraction, but it's been something that's helped out over the winter months. Uh, and this would be putting um, a large piece of infrastructure uh, and associated uh, private benefit around uh, in an area that already is really popular during summer. So I see that as a bit of a conflict at this moment and I won't be supporting this tonight, but do hope that we all have an approach from the traders that um, recognises that that's a really attractive um, space in and of itself and we can find a way forward for this project uh, in future. Uh, Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I must admit I'm pretty on the fence about uh, this one. I sort of, I can see the, the arguments that um, that uh, DELP haven't, you know, given us any suggestions about anywhere else that would be good uh, to put this. I hear the arguments from various um, traders and traders associations about the economic benefits that they think, that they think this will bring. Personally, I, I am, am sceptical. Um, I think that um, COVID is sending shockwaves throughout our economy that, you know, some of the things that we think might be really effective may not. Um, so, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I think that um, you know the suggestion that if we don't support this, that's 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 the death knell for business or that sort of stuff is, I think, is speculation and it's not helpful when we're trying to look at a um, an application on its merits. Um, I'm, I do also share the concerns about the impact on on usable open space um, uh, on the foreshore, which is one of the most precious things. What we're being asked to do here is give open space that belongs to the community to a private operator um, and hoping that there will be some benefits that flow from that. Um, having said that, uh, I do think that um, it's kind of worth a shot, I guess. But what I what I would really like to consider is when we do come back in the 12 months time, is if it is wildly successful uh, and the and the operator is seeing a massive benefit, I want to see some of those benefits coming back directly, not just to business in the area, but to the community because they're the ones that are given the open space. Um, and that is that I think is only fair. So what we've done through our parklets policy is gift um, public land to uh, businesses for a fee, but the gift the use of that public land, which we hadn't done before, um, in order to try to keep things afloat. And I'm really supportive of that. I think this is a similar sort of thing, but at some point we are going to need to see if, it's, if it is really successful that um, the community needs uh, to get that investment back because they've given away some land in order to do that. So um, I think I will uh, sort of grudgingly support this. Um, I hope that it's really successful. I hope that my bar humbug nature is proven wrong. Um, but uh, but yes, I think that's, that's sort of where I am on this one. Great. Um, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question and maybe it's not a clarifying question that can be answered if I may. Uh, Councillor Copsey referred to it coming back in another um, possible location, but I wanted to clarify, officers have already considered that and they, there are no other reasonable options to come back with? I thought that's what was said. Could I clarify that, please? Uh, through you, Mayor, we've not been able to locate an appropriate alternate location at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bond. Um, I won't be supporting this as this is the most contested space in St Kilda in summer on a on a warm day you cannot get anywhere in this particular space so the the loss of any of this area um, you know even if it is only just five percent is a great loss this particular area 
the, the green open space of St Kilda and the parks and our foreshore is one of the reasons people come down to St Kilda. So it, it is an attractor in itself. We, if we start and fill all of these open spaces with various um, attractions and other other items other than just open space, like has sort of happened a little bit down there over the years, um, we are going to lose what it is that brings people to, to St Kilda. Um, as I said, this is the busiest space in St Kilda over summer. It's, it's not just the 5% that this will take up, it's the shade it will put across the rest of South Beach Reserve during summer. Um, we've always left this space relatively free during the, the January months and not scheduled too many events or any events down there just because of the nature of January being so busy in St Kilda. So this will be the first time we've actually done that if this is, is successful. Um, I would also like to see it come back in another location. I think there's plenty of other locations around we could look at. There's the Seabars car park uh, immediately on the other side of this building. Um, there's the triangle across the road. I'd have no issue with this being put in the triangle where it's, it's, it's not taking up... Um, green space on the foreshore and yes there, there would be a revenue loss to council but um, so be it if this is such a great attractor that, that the revenue lost to council from the loss of car parking would 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 be offset by the benefits this would bring in by locating it somewhere in the triangle um, so I think there are there are plenty of other locations it doesn't have to go on our green space on the foreshore um, perhaps it could come back if they wanted to put it here March to May like they have done previously when when the area maybe needs a little bit of an attraction to bring people down there. Um, it, it probably doesn't need it December, January and, and February um, when it is full. You know, it's something we could do during the, the winter months or the less warm months. Um, but certainly I, I can't support it um, going in here during our most contested and our busiest time of the year. Councillor Pearl. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I also won't be supporting the motion and it's all very well and good for me to sit here in my nice warm house with my nice suit on and with my stable paycheck coming in the door um, to opine on and comment on how difficult things must be for small business people. But I, um, I apologise in some respects to the people that uh, spoke here this evening because I, I do have a huge amount of sympathy respect and admiration for what those businesses are going through at the moment and the devastating effect that these lockdowns would be having on those individual traders and their families, uh, etc. But um, I really don't think this idea moves the dial. If, if I thought it was going to move the dial um, substantially for their incomes uh, and their livelihoods and their families, um, I'd be the first to support it. Um, I, 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 I just don't think the the amenity loss that this, this provides an area during this time, which is already saturated with people, um, is is going to materially help um, those businesses. And um, it's all very good and well for me to sit here, as I said, in my nice warm house um, to have that view. But um, it's uh, it's probably the first time I've ever, ever um, voted against something where so many people of traders have come and... Um, put such a forceful opinion together. But uh, again, honestly, if I thought this was going to materially move the dial, I'd be the first to vote for it. But um, th this area uh, during those months is uh, already heavily utilised. We've had a significant number of problems there in the past five years um, around antisocial activity, which fortunately council's been able to bring, bring under control uh, using CCTV, etc. But I, I don't materially see the case that this uh, adds to it. Uh, again, it's easy for me to sit here and say that and I apologise dearly to the um, traders who obviously have a, a different view but um, on the balance of weighing it up in terms of community benefit, public benefit and general amenity, I, um, I don't support it. Councillor Clark. Thanks Madam Mayor. Um, I'm very supportive of initiatives and activities that bring more people into the municipality um, and and supportive of the traders in various different ways. Um, however, as a councillor, 
I find myself having to consider the whole community. Um, um, that if we're, uh, I'm, I'm not opposed to the Ferris wheel idea itself, but I am not supported in the solicitation uh, for the Ferris wheel. I walk past this area um, regularly during summer and it is packed every weekend, every time it's hot or even, even appears to be hot, even if it doesn't appear to be hot for me. Uh, this lawn is packed and the beach is packed. And this is part of I, our municipality that's iconic and that does draw people who then come and spend money around our municipality as well to this area. Um, you know, I note that as the officer pointed out, uh, this is something that hasn't been done in summer before and I suspect the reason why is because it is such a busy, high profile area um, that it probably uh, has lent itself to do it between the months of March and May. Um, so, you know, I, I also note as I walk past regularly that, you know, the same area competes with an outdoor cinema. Um, we have music festivals there from time to time. So the space is, is hotly contested as someone said, and, and it is very, very busy. And if we're not gonna leave our green spaces, I see the same green space packed at Elwood. Um, if we're not gonna leave that uh, free for the community uh, to enjoy over our summer months, um, then you know I think that that's a big challenge um, as a councillor needing to balance up all those um, those people and the uses for for that area. So um, I I think the reduction of the space for the grass area on South Beach Reserve is not ideal, um, and that an alternative location should be found. Um, and for that reason. I'm not supportive of the Ferris wheel, but you know I do uh, appreciate that the traders may not um, may it's maybe not what you want to hear, but um, we are very supportive, and I'm very supportive of other measures where we can support the traders um, through this difficult period. I I agree with the changes about bringing the extensions back to the council uh, councillors as well, because um, I did have concerns with the three year period. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sirikov. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I must say that I am uh, agreeing with Councillor uh, Bond and Councillor Clark. Um, I, I'd love to see a Ferris wheel there, um, but I, I just don't think it's the appropriate location. And I hope that we can work uh, with um, extraordinary events to find a more appropriate location, whether it be in the Triangle or in the Sea Baths car park. I think uh, we, we could make it work, but um, in such a popular area where we've got com other competing activities, um, I think this could um, not work out the way that we probably would like to. Um, so, but I, I don't, I don't think this is something that's uh, dead in the water. Um, that we could find something uh, a better location to go forward with this event to make everybody happy. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Martin, to close. On oh, no, a question, sorry, question. We've got a question from Councillor Consolo. Sorry, Councillor Martin. Sorry, if I may, um, a clarifying question. With Luna Park being there, they, I think we asked their opinion and was um, the option of um, the Triangle Car Park said one way or the other about their feelings because that's now on that side of the road? Lauren, um, through you, Mayor, we haven't asked Luna Park specifically about the Triangle Car Park and would need to. They had certainly expressed their support um, for the South Beach Reserve site. Um, the, the Triangle Car Park is under consideration for a number of major events that we'll be bringing to, to Council um, in, in upcoming weeks and months. So it will just be a decision as to what we may wish to do with that space over summer. Councillor Martin. Can I start, Madam Mayor, by thanking my eight council co councillor colleagues for all making some very relevant points. And I think it's one of the best debates that, we've, that I've been involved with on a council in eight, in eight months. Um, I'm still going to support the motion and I'd like not to rebut the arguments of those councillors who said that they don't feel at this time they can support the motion because I fully understand their arguments and there are some good arguments there. However, we've got an opportunity to do something in the very short term to support people who are really in need. We've heard from our local traders. 
We've heard that they're bleeding. We have a way of supporting them. If we go on past history, we didn't debate the Parkless program for hours and hours, days and days. We moved very quickly. We used public space. We've used that space for 12 months and we've just passed a motion where we're going to go back and see whether we want to extend that program. So we didn't worry about taking up some public space and have a long debate about that and it proved to be very successful. So I think the, the argument that um, we, 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 we're taking public space, one of the reasons I'm on the council is every time, in some, every time I go past the Katani Gardens on my bike and I can't go through because there are events there and we're taking up a huge amount of public land there. and there may be really, really good reasons. And when that comes to council, I may change my mind, but I've always been concerned that we've seemed to be giving lots of our space to lots of events. So we have a long track record on our council of doing this and I'm not sure there must be benefits to the council, but I'm not sure what they are yet. I'm sure I'll learn about them later. This is something for a much smaller parcel of land that I consider we will get huge benefits, not just for our traders, but for the amenity of the beach itself by bringing families in that will improve the ambience. One of our councillors talked about antisocial behaviour at the beach. One of the best ways to um, counteract antisocial behaviour is to have families present. It changes the atmosphere of the beach. So I see that we'll be improving the atmosphere on the beach. We'll be supporting local traders. At a time when we may still be in lockdown, we may not have hundreds of thousands of people wanting to come from all over Australia to St Kilda Beach. They might not even be able to come from outside of Melbourne if we're in lockdown. If ever we're going to do something like this, this is the time to do it. We've got a track record of giving far larger spaces to our local committee for other events. This is a much smaller space. I agree with um, Councillor Copsey. It's not the ideal place. I'd love to see it somewhere else. And I'd hope that in 12 months time, if we decide that it's a good idea to have a Ferris wheel there, and at the end of a trial period, we'll be able to find somewhere else. Perhaps once the developments on the St Kilda Pier are progressing further, we can find a space closer to the pier. But if ever we're going to do it, now is the time to A, support local traders, B, support families across Melbourne, C, increase the amenity of the beach, and D, make our beach area a really good, really feel good place. So I commend the motion to all of you and I know that you have reservations. I think if we trial this for six months of the summer period, um, in 12 months time, we may be able to, if, if the wheel works, we may be able to put it somewhere else. But if we don't do it, we've missed a golden opportunity to support local business, support our families, support local amenity. Let's vote in favour. All right, everyone, I'm gonna put that to the um, vote under division, Councillor Sirikoff. Oh boy. Um, I'm just hoping that I know I should be just saying yes or no to this. Um, I just we can't we can't enter debate. I'm sorry, oh, Councillor no. Sirikoff. So I'm going to say I'm against. Councillor Baxter. Oh. Councillor Bond. Against. Councillor Clark. Against. Councillor Copsey. Against. Councillor Crawford. For. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. Councillor Pearl. Against. That motion has failed. All right, 13.1, which is the councillor's expenses, monthly reporting May 2021. Uh, are there any questions for officers? If there are none, do I have a mover for the officer's recommendation? Uh, Councillor Pearl, oh no, sorry, Councillor Copsey to move and Councillor Pearl to second. Councillor uh, Copsey. It's reserved, thanks. Councillor Pearl? No, thanks. Uh, would anyone else like to speak to the motion? I, I might quickly say, I, I, I do note that we um, are still in process of looking at uh, adjustment of our childcare uh, arrangements and, and that has yet to come back to us. And I look forward to that moment. Would anyone else like to speak to it? Councillor Consolo. I too look forward to hearing a bit more about that review because I have yet to claim, even though I've been out a lot of expense um, for being on council. So thank you. Anyone else like to speak to the motion? Back to Councillor Copsey. I don't need to close, thanks. Hey, let's put that to the vote. Councillor Baxter. Four. Councillor Bond. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Copsey. Four. Councillor Crawford. Four. Councillor Consolo. Four. Councillor Martin. Four. 
Councillor Pearl. Four. And Councillor Sirikoff. Four. That motion has passed. Uh, so we have had the notice of motion, which is the next agenda item. There is uh, that has been um, withdrawn. Uh, Fifteen on the agenda is reports by council delegates. Do we have any reports from council delegates? I'm going to move on because I can't. Oh, Councillor Pearl. Just quickly to note what's happening at the South Melbourne market at the moment. There's been a, another exposure site, which has been the third time that's happened. So. Um, well done to the staff at the South Mill Market. Fortunately, it happened uh, over a period where we were able to do a layover to do a deep clean, but I assure all the citizens of the fine city of the city of Port Phillip um, and patrons of the South Mill Market that is very much safe uh, and very, many, very, very much ready for your patronage um, this weekend, over this weekend. So thank you particularly to the hardworking staff members at the South Mill Market for dealing with what is a difficult situation. Uh, and fortunately, those traders that are allowed and permitted to operate at the moment um, have been able to do so um, unabated by the, um, the exposure sites that have been um, identified in the market other than those that are obviously tier one exposure sites. Any other councillors like to report back? No? Okay, moving on to urgent business. Councillors, do you have any items of urgent business that I don't know about? Great. Uh, councillors with confidential matters, we do not have any for tonight. So there being no further business, uh, I declare tonight's meeting closed. Uh, stay safe, everyone out there. And yes, we'll be back in a couple of weeks.